the theme has been around uh, deterrence um, and uh, emerging uh, technologies. And so it's great to have you both here to have a conversation around, around that. Um, and I'll ask you to introduce yourselves in a, in a moment. Um, but deterrence and emerging techno technology, I mean, it's an interesting juxtaposition. You know, deterrence is a human activity. It's actions that we take, and these are my words, to um, influence um, adversary, an adversary's decisions um, or influence non-decisions um, and all of what that means. And emerging technology, disruptive technologies, you know, technologies that are applied, are being applied, are expected to be applied in the all-domain operating environment from seabed to space to affect uh, shape deterrence. And of course, if deterrence fails, then to enable um, operational effect um, with competitive advantage um, that leads to victory. So, um, we're going to kind of explore this here um, <coughs> as we uh, work our way through uh, the conversation. There, there, for the two of you, um, earlier in the day, there were s some really interesting presentations around disruptive technologies, autonomous systems, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, quantum cyber, um, space capabilities, um, and what that all means um, in terms of the future, or could mean in terms of the future of war. And so, um, what we'll do here this afternoon was, is uh, I'll ask uh, our guests to briefly introduce themselves. Um, I've got a question for, uh, uh, for Senator Van. I've got a question for Dr. Seaback, and we'll have a bit of a conversation, um, and then we'll open it up to you um, before we wrap up uh, the conference. So, Leslie, over to you. Just introduce yourself for the, for the audience and perhaps a few words about why um, you're here on this panel. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, okay. So my background. Um, gosh, uh, I'd like to say I've just been around, but that might sound as though it's a bit a bit odd. Currently at large, I've worked in Department of Defence, Office of National Assessments, uh, Finance, PM and C. Uh, I was at the Bureau of Meteorology as CIO uh, during their cyber breach. Uh, and worked in DTA, uh, and most recently it was setting up something called the Cyber Institute at the Australian National University, and now currently at large, so I'm having a lot of fun. Uh, my, if I, I've, usually if I'm asked about, you know, what, what I am, I often go back and say I feel I'm always a sort of policy officer, particularly as, you know, around the strategic area, because that's essentially my roots, working defence and, you know, uh, at various points. So... All these questions are of interest. They're a nice intersection about where my career has brought me to. Um, why is this of interest? Well, three main points. Firstly, we are seeing a re-emergence, if not an intensification, of great power rivalry. But it's in a more complex environment that we saw than we saw during the Cold War. Uh, and there's two points to that. Firstly, uh, we are seeing it's much more multipolar for a start. Before during the Cold War, it's very much you know, sort of the um, you know the Warsaw Pact versus the West, etc. But now it's, you're starting to see uh, a lot of small and even and middle power countries also feeling ambitious, noting that the, you know, the general strategic environment is much more or much less constrained and there are much more ways of exerting power and, uh, in, in this world. And that's been enabled by the second point, which is the technological competition. That's really come to the fore. So there's many more ways that countries, nations are able to influence their surrounds and even sort of, again, uh, coerce or compete with uh, neighbours and adversaries. The second is the fact that we're seeing a third domain of strategy emerging. So for most of human history, we've had conventional strategy and we're quite so far with that. We pretty much know what that looks like. After the Second World War, we then came to grips with nuclear strategy. In the last 10 or 20 years, 20 or 30 years, more, like, more likely, we've had to come to grips with cyber. And that's a very different strategic domain. It's a very different way of thinking about the world and exerting influence. I hesitate to say power. Uh, but a lot of those ideas that we had from conventional and nuclear don't fit into cyber. And what's often interesting to me is how those three domains interact. 
and particularly things like deterrence and how that interacts as well. And the third point is, you know, again, I keep coming back. I see myself, you know, I was brought up in defence departments in many respects as a civilian, not military. But I keep coming back to my home ground, which is Australian defence policy, which is, you know, again, deterrence is that third pillar of, you know, shape, deter, respond or defeat. Uh, and so we need to actually really think hard about how Australian, how Australian defence policy is going to operate in such a world because it's a core pillar of everything we do. Uh, and I, I do worry that we're not thinking or you know, really getting to grips about what it means in, in the current world. Yeah, thanks, Leslie. And we're, we're going to drill down on that particular – or pull on that thread um, when we come back to you. Uh, Senator Van. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, it's a, a, a wonderful place to, to be. I'm, I'm also a student here as well as being a, uh, a, a senator. Um, I, I completed a Masters of International Relations and then wanted to drill down into the, the national security bit of it. So uh, I'm a student doing the Masters of Strategy and Security here. And um, so I feel very lucky to, to be here and, and a little bit underqualified given some of the people in the room. Um, as a parliamentarian, I think our first uh, objective or our first responsibility should be promoting and protecting Australia's national interests. Um, so obviously foreign affairs and trade are, are some of that promotional bit uh, and obviously defence is the protecting. Uh, I'm particularly interested in given the, you know, as Leslie said about the emergence of great power competition and the multipolarity of it, is the, the role of irregular warfare, of hybrid grey zone tactics and how they're being used, as, so not just cyber, but right across the, the range of um, hybrid warfare. So how that's impacting Australia, whether that's geoeconomic coercion um, or affecting other states. And really looking at that as a leading indicator of where, where war might come from and how it might be fought. Um, I think that's you know, a real area that um, uh, I know David's very interested in and, and thank him for, for all he's taught me. Um, so it's, I think then it's a, a matter of how you broaden that out, how you look at that as part of your strategy. So not just cyber, but how you look at the, the whole package of grey zone and hybrid warfare. Great. Thanks, David. So let, let's, let's drill down a bit on, on that. So you've, you've obviously made it clear that as a parliamentarian, you, you think deeply about Australia's national interests, about Australia's place in the world, and what are the um, sort of challenges to those vital interests and what Australia needs to do to continue to shape a region and, and a globe which enables um, Australia as a, um, a maritime trading nation to prosper. Um, so having said that, uh, what, what views can you share with us around emerging technologies uh, and, and how you see them affecting or shaping Australia's uh, strategic interests in the Indo-Pacific? Yeah, thank you. Um, I won't pretend to be a, a technologist. Um, I don't think that's, that's my role. And uh, as you said, uh, you've had some great people um, on this stage here today talking about those things. But I think where I take it from is going back and looking at, at, at about how they'll be used, um, not what will be used. Uh, as you say, we're a maritime trading nation. Um, we have a trade surplus of some $14 billion. Uh, we, trade, we export $170 billion to, to China uh, and we have a massive trade surplus with them. So in terms of you know, what uh, war might look like, there's um, concerns in my mind that you know, China might never have to fire a weapon at Australia you know, to have an effect, a warlike effect on us, um, you know, simply by cutting off our exports. You know, we've seen that happen with you know, $2 billion worth of barley. Um, uh, you know, we'd sell them, we export approximately $100 billion worth of iron ore uh, each year, you know, if they just turn that off for three months, you know, would see an effect on our economy, which would make COVID look like it was, uh, you know, just a cold. So there is um, real doubts in my mind about 
you know, how we're moving forward on this. And obviously in the 2020 uh, DSU, the Defence Strategic Update, uh, we talked about shaping, deterring and responding if necessary, as you put it. And I think obviously AUKUS was a, a great step towards that and uh, the submarines uh, coming forward are, uh, are going to be wonderful at, at shaping and deterring. You know, my fear is that uh, they're coming way too late in the picture. You know, if we're not even getting uh, forward rotations until 2027, 2028, you know, I think the window of shaping um, or deterring might close in that, that time. Uh, and obviously I'm, I'm leaning a little bit on the Davidson window um, theme there. But you know, if, uh, if we really want to be deterring, then some of these technologies have to be coming forward right now. Now, whether it's nuclear submarines is obviously one of them. Uh, it'll be, I'm, I'm desperately interested to see what the uh, DSR uh, that the government's currently doing is going to put forward because I think uh, it's going to miss a whole lot of tricks. Uh, I think there's going to be a, a lot of talk about long range strike, um, uh, hypersonics, et cetera, et cetera. But again, you know, I think there's going, not going to be a whole of battle or, or a joint arms fighting type aspect to it, which I think is, is more important than what technologies we actually get. Capability is one thing, but how you um, join it all together and fight with it is, is I think, going to be the, the real trick to what, um, how Australia defends itself. So I've been doing a lot of thinking and, and writing in preparation for that because, for example, um, yeah, I think there'll be it'll be very light on on grey zone um, and anything hybrid. Um, you know, I, I'll be very surprised if it if it looks at irregular warfare in any way, shape, or form. So, I think you know what we have to watch out for is is it doing too much um, you know on that long range strike and not enough on uh, things such as you know that joint fighting capability. Because if we have um, you know long range strike, you know we we're not going to get you know, a range long enough to fire it from Australia. So we are going to have to be setting up bases elsewhere, hopefully with friend friendly nations. Um, and, you know, that way, you, you know, you can, you, you might have a chance of holding off uh, and defending our sea lanes of communication. It's, uh, but then, you know, in the war, the, the lessons of the Second World War were that if you don't have enough troops to protect those, those bases, and you know, including in that, you know, armour um, and combined arms fighting to be able to protect those those bases, you're really going to you know be taken out very very quickly, and you know you can't have um, you, you can't have people you know bases protecting long range strike if it's not under armour. And I think you know we've seen that uh, the government's walking away from the infantry fighting vehicle program. Um, and, and that's a real concern for me. So, um, b before I go to Leslie, you know, it, there's a bit of a, con there's a contradiction or a paradox uh, it's sort of emerging here around the DSR. I mean, the, the ambition is there, the, 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 the rhetoric to, to accelerate towards sustaining competitive advantage in order to um, deter and, if necessary, respond in this decade to an existential threat that is building rapidly north. Um, and yet, on the, on the corollary of this is we're limited to 2% GDP. Um, there are things that are going to have to stop. There's a, uh, I'm hearing 15% sustainment uh, cuts. When I talk to folks in defense, it's not leaning forward uh, towards the all-domain fight. It's more, at least at the strategic level, reacting to uh, the pain that's coming around um, uh, d deficit reduction, if I can put it that way. And we've all been through these um, deficit reduction exercises. They're, they're soul-destroying. So, you know, as a, as, a, as a parliamentarian, you know, what, how do you react to that? What, what did, did, have I got it right or, or is...? Uh, I think you're spot on. I think, uh, you know, the May budget um, will, uh, from, from everything that the Treasury is saying, you know, that we're going to be seeing a lot of... Uh, um, budget measures in there. Now, what that does to the defence budget, um, well, we've, we've seen this show before. Uh, last time Labor was in government, and I, d I don't want to try and make this political in any way, shape or form, but, you know, 
having you work through what all the options on, in the DSR might be, you know, there's no way that we can keep uh, defence spending at, at, at 2%. Um, there's going to have to be a, 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 a real uplift to that to at least 2.5, if not 3% of GDP, if we are going to achieve any um, deterrence effect at all. Um, and that's just to deter. You know, obviously, you know, if we have to respond to the sort of war stocks we're going to need, um, as we've seen with, you know, with the Ukraine, are, are just enormous. Um, and, and just the lessons out of there, uh, your in audience might be interested to know, I was in Ukraine down in the Donbass um, last August. It was, I went there because I'd, I'd been part of you know, getting the Bushmasters into, into Ukraine and I went down and I met with the, the troops that are using them. And it was surprising how uh, effective they, they were. I mean, they're effectively using them as an infantry fighting vehicle, you know, rather than a, you know, a protected mobility vehicle. But uh, that gave them the speed and pace to be able to, uh, you know, outpace the, uh, the Russians. Um, and, and that's what's brought about a whole lot of their success. So, you know, they're currently asking for the Hawkeyes for, for similar sorts of reasons. So, th but that, you know, going back to your point about, you know, the budget, um, it, it's hard to square the circle of where the DSR is going to take us, you know, without having to, you know, a significant uplift in, in budget. So, you know, where those cuts are going to come from, whether it's from sustainment, whether that hollows out our, our capability over the long term. And again, you know, the, the Russians have shown us, uh, you know, quite glaringly, you know, what not uh, sustaining your 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 forces can do, you know, in a fight. So um, I've got my fingers crossed um, you know, that we, we see some uplift in that budget. Uh, I think Australians are going to demand it, uh, even if it means some budget pain somewhere else. But, uh, you know, it's a, the, the government has a, a lot of heavy lifting to do. Yeah, all of our fingers are crossed. Yeah. And uh, so we're looking forward to that announcement in two weeks today, as I understand. Um, although it'll be interesting to see what is what comprises the public statement because much of that strategic assessment in the DSR will remain classified. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see how that how the government communicates uh, with Australians. So Leslie, um, David had talked about deterrence and he and he kind of linked it with uh, economic prosperity. So let's talk about China. Let's talk about um, uh, deterrence. And I, I, I suppose um, one measure of success in deterrence would be that the ore continues to flow north, at least until the Chinese diversify into Africa, or other other uh, commodities continue to, to flow. But um, I said earlier, you know, deterrence is about shaping uh, decisions in Beijing. So what is your assessment of Australia's deterrence strategy, and, and uh, is it good enough? Uh, it, is there more that needs to be done? Uh, I would probably describe it as a work in progress. Uh, and the reason being is because I have a general sense that and again, I think this almost reflects a, a couple of points when you were talking, I was thinking in, in my mind, we're still operating in a very much a peacetime environment as though it was 10, 15 years ago. We've still got the same pace of decision, decision making. I don't have a sense of urgency when I walk around sort of, you know, the halls of Russell or anywhere else. Um, I'm not seeing a development of depth that we would expect, even, you know, even the putting aside, let's get the latest, greatest, you know, bits of emerging tech. Uh, there's a lot of stuff here that needs to happen in the broader economy for us to be able to sustain, uh, you know, a severe, you know, whether it's a fight or pressure in the grey zone uh, for some time. That goes to manufacturing and I, I will, you know, I'll really mit regret missing you, uh, the talks today. I'd hope to be here. But whenever I go to talks about emerging technology and defence, I rarely hear about manufacturing, about supply chains, about how we're going to get this in and put it into our doctrine and actually really use it. How we're going to build our civilian capability because it's only, the defence part's only that part much. We need to build the civilian capability by that much to be able to sustain that, you know, fairly thin, narrow base. Um, and that's in terms of skills as well as personnel and manpower and so on as well. So, you know, when I often, you know, it's always here talks about emerging technology, I keep saying, so where are the wheels that make this happen? What's going to, you know, where's, where all that's, what's going, where are we putting money into that? Because we can buy some of this other stuff off the shelf, but it won't actually necessarily give us that sustainability over a long period of time. 
So, um, coming back to how we think about China and, and deterrence. So, deterrence is all about, you know, sort of, you know, the ben trying to actually understand in thinking about how an enemy might see the benefits of an action they want to take, what they see as a cost, and what would it take from them or consequences of they're not doing that action. And that's where, you know, again, the point you made earlier, Paul, about this is very much a human activity. It's in the mind. It's an influence operation. It's in the cognitive space. But it comes down to your intent, and that's echoed not just in the glossies that we put up online. That's probably the narrowest, shallowest representation of deterrence um, because that doesn't really bear the weight of what actually happens in the real world. But there is intent. So policy statements, etc. There's capabilities. You know, so what capabilities have we got to bring about the effect? What friends can we bring to the table? So again, you know, you pointed before about, you know, how do we actually get people in the region to sort of, you know, support us? It's not just the US or, you know, our friends from the other side of the world, um, the UK. Uh, it's also those people in the region who will actually, you know, allow spacing. You know, when, when we want to know that when push comes to shove, we can put people there that we can go and use their ports, we can put our ships into a resupply. And that's a good thing. That also helps harden us as well. And then ultimately it's the actions. But then it comes down to how that's seen by the opposition. So it's their perceptions. And frankly, to be blunt, in the world of deterrence, particularly um, you know, both nuclear and conventional deterrence, it's got to hurt. It's got to be painful. It's got to actually be enough to change the decision calculus of that small group of people, if we're talking about the China in the CCP and how they see the world, because they won't give a damn if, you know, something happens to, you know, a group, you know, of Hainan Island, for example, unless it actually hurts their prestige, etc. So this is where, when we start thinking about capability, things such as strike is really important. But again, we've got to have strike that reaches those particular, you know, whether it reaches Beijing or those particular points, we actually understand what really matters to them. I don't think we're doing, we may be doing that thinking, it's probably behind closed doors. But, you know, again, we've got to do that thinking. Um, it's about depth, because frankly, we probably want to have a second strike capability, not just a one-shot, you know, one-shot military, as I think Brendan Sargent put it some years ago. Um, and I don't, you know, I'm not necessarily talking about <coughs> nuclear second strike, that's a different thing, but, you know, be have, have, able to have that depth. And then, the, then you get to those elements of denial as well. So if you do do something, then we'll deny you those outcomes. And that might mean that we deny you access to, you know, whatever it is. So you can see the debates around China-Taiwan. You know, this idea of the Silicon Shield is that, you know, that if, if China invades Taiwan, they will destroy the chip you know, um, uh, uh, manufacturing and, you know, deny them access to that technology. I don't think the Silicon Shield is going to be the way, bear the weight of expectation, but that's the sort of thinking that they're thinking about as well. So denial can work both ways. You do this, we will destroy it, or as opposed, we will deny you access to things. And I think just talking about deterrence by denial is nice and safe politically, but it's only a small part of the equation we need to think about. Um, now, on emerging technology, uh, Again, I, I agree with you, uh, David. It actually is how about how you use it as well. Uh, and uh, I have a, when I talk about orcas, I actually talk about we need a three-speed approach. Let's just give the submarines for the sake of argument a given. Okay, that might happen to 2030, 2040. God knows who, when it's going to turn up. And I think that's outside the window. We really want that capability. Uh, for the record, I just say buy some Virginias and get on with it pay money to you know, build up their capability in building, producing more of them, but just, just do it. Um, so they got that out there. Uh, and I will say that too, that the, the decision to say we will go and do this is part of your intent and part of your action, so that also factors, you know, there's an element of that factors into deterrence strategy. Uh, then you've got the second, second one, which is your AUKUS Pillar 2. Also too, I think that's going to come too late. And there's too much hanging on to, you know, emerging tech as a magic silver bullet. Often when I talk about emerging technology, I refuse to get into discussions about what I call technology magic fairy dust. Uh, because, you know, the latest Qantas magazine thing is just, you know, I saw this during blockchain stuff and so on too. We have to have the blockchain. You know, what does it mean? I looked at the blockchain, was at the bomb. I could do pretty much, you know, with, you know, with a whole bunch of existing technologies, what everyone's talking about doing with the blockchain. Why would I go down that path? Similarly, I think there's too much hanging on to this magic silver bullet of emerging technology. 
And that brings me to the first speed. And I think it was Michelle Flournoy. I did read it somewhere. I've got to track down this quote where she's saying, basically, we're looking at two to three, perhaps five years. Work out what we can do with existing technology. We've got some amazing stuff out there now. Let's use it and put it together. Because if you know how technology works, technologies are assemblies of other technologies. So they're often putting you know, X plus Y plus Z. Oh, actually, why don't we bring A, B and C along and see what happens there and bring those assemblies together. And so, you know, what I would love to see coming out of the DSR, and I can pretty much guarantee it won't be there, is that the, you know, ADF has a giant hackathon where they just say, right, let's throw people and do this and see what we can do, and then we'll factor in a doctrine, and we, we make our organisation sufficiently loose and adaptable that we can do this, because I fear that well, our systems, our cultures are too restrictive and constrained to let us change, adapt to that world. That's terrific. Thanks, Leslie. I, I'm... I'm reminded by your, in, in your remarks of um, of General Campbell's um, presentation at the uh, at the gallery about three and a half years ago, where he he said, "Look, if um, if the ADF is going to a fight in 2025, it's going with the force structure I have today." Yeah. And uh, you know, it's it's kind of but but as we continue to advance and improve, you know, force structure, we do it as best we can, in, in incrementally, obviously, but. Um, but this is all happening at a time when we're observing the PLA, you know, really accelerating um, uh, f force structure, capitalization, and capability, and, and ambition. And it's uh, it's obviously quite a challenge. And, and 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 from a U.S. perspective, as they look out at the uh, sort of the uh, great power competition, and they see the scale at which China is driving towards a global market capture. Uh, in, in, in chips and, and, uh, and autonomy and, and other sort of key disruptive technologies, the, the, there's a real fear here that there will be a strategic tipping point in which uh, the flow of capital will, 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 will go towards China and, and enrich and, and then shape um, their ability to, or enable their ability to shape the global system in a way that completely undermines that which we have been prepared to fight for. Um, for the past, what, 80 years or so. So that's a bit of a challenge. Um, which takes me to the, the next question for the two of you, which is um, around AUKUS. I mean, you, you, you mentioned AUKUS. Um, you know, f for me, um, and, and many others, I hope, you know, under, underpinning AUKUS is this desire to, to for three trusted um, partners at that sort of bullseye of strategic trust to find new ways to go faster, smarter um, in, in collaborating as a whole of nation across the three in, in, in generating and sustaining that competitive advantage, all domain capa you know, capability. Um, but there obviously are challenges to that. And I'm just wondering what, uh, if you'd care to observe on what you see as the, as the, uh, the opportunities here, as, as the obstacles that need to be identified and, and overcome, and, uh, and how you see this also ex ex extending beyond, and Andrew Neely mentioned this in the last panel, extending beyond the three AUKUS partners to those other key partners and allies like Japan, uh, Korea, India, and others. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'll take a first crack at that. Um, uh, earlier in the week, I, I did a <clears throat> Pardon me. I recorded a podcast uh, with Clementine Starling uh, from the Atlantic Council, and if you haven't read her paper or their paper uh, on uh, it's called "Seizing the Advantage," uh, it, it's very much well worth looking at. And in that paper, they they use the term uh, "lattice deterrence" um, and "lattice defence." Um, I've read probably every defence strategic white paper or update or whatever you want to call it from uh, around the world, you know, over the last 10 years or so. Um, and, you know, the, the amount of times now that you see the, the term integrated uh, defence or integrated deterrence is, is just growing um, and faster and faster. So I think, you know, our advantage is not going to be just a technological one. It's how we fight with our partners and, and really looking at that... Uh, that ability to be able to interop uh, the interoperability of, of joint fighting. Um, in my uh, master's dissertation, um, I did a, a deep dive into 
uh, all our multilateral uh, uh, arrangements as Australia and, and ask the question, do they fit, are they fit for purpose for, for what we're facing right now and moving forward? Uh, and the clear answer is, is no. You know, AUKUS, the Quad, they're all wonderful. They're, they're, uh, they're fantastic. But none of them do what Australia is going to need to do to be able to shape, deter and respond. Uh, so in that paper, I put forward an argument for an Indo-Pacific Treaty Organisation. Um, so that we're, we're not just relying on the US, we're not just relying on, on the UK, um, Japan, India, etc. They're all going to be important parts of it. But I think if we put together a, a treaty organisation sort of built off the NATO model uh, you know, with an Article 5, but I argue that there should be an Article 5 and then an Article 5B because uh, you, we know at the moment at the very least that the ASEAN nations you know, won't, wouldn't sign up to a, an Article 5. But I, uh, I borrowed the, the wording straight out of the Five Powers Defence um, Agreement uh, for the 5B, which simply says that nations will co consider going to the aid of other members. And that way, you know, I think we could get ASEAN on board with an organisation like that. And as we've seen uh, in Europe, uh, with the, the ascension of Finland into NATO this past week, uh, as aggression grows, the you know, uh, countries will look to balance with other partners and, you know, for their own... Uh, defence and their own deterrence. So, I think you know our our argument uh, is, is not for more technology; it's for more friends. I think that's the the way we really need to look at the the world. Okay. Um, one thing I would say is that we need to be careful when we look at China, and we sort of admire how it's done things. So we have to be careful that we don't engage in it with in authoritarian envy. Because uh, I do detect an element of that uh, within the public service because, you know, bureaucracy is all like, you know, be able to do things where they could direct outcomes. Uh, and I think we what we need to do is actually say, actually, you know, there's better ways of doing this and we should be doing two things. One is doubling down on the, you know, the strengths of democracies, what made democracies able to generate such... Uh, you know, uh, well-being, economic you know, outcomes, uh, good social outcomes, and be able to harness the people, you know, to those outcomes, rather than merely hope, you know, do the lazy, lazy way, which is frankly what the authoritarians do, which is you know, direct people to do it, and have the power to do so. Uh, it also means too that we also need to um, restore the muscle memory of through the Cold War, even World War II. Again, we've got to show that we've got to have something to fight for, you know, and that's not just the military. Too often these debates just, you know, collapse down to, it's like sort of, you know, quantum superposition. They collapse, keeps collapsing down to the military, so that's the only outcome. But again, the military is there. Dele its powers and capability are delegated from this civilian authority. It's there for the civilian purposes. So we need to actually, you know, re-engage with the civilian side of the house. And this is really important when we think about things such as trust, so, you know, which is, again, core of AUKUS, which I pointed out the other night when I gave a talk, is not quite seen that way by other nations. In fact, if you talk to the French, they would say that AUKUS is a story of betrayal. So we need to just remember this. And actually, if we take those lessons about what is trust in international relations, I think we've got a better way of actually starting to think about how do we build, you know, again, once up, whether it's something like NATO for the Indo-Pacific, etc., because again, you sort of you know you need that willingness to have people who are willing to give something up in return for something. Uh, you need to have a practice of behaviours. In NATO's case, they've codified that you know in an institution. In our case, with ANZUS, we never bothered with that. We just had good friendly talks because we got along so well. That made the third thing, which is it's got to be adaptable. So you know if, you know very in change. So NATO will do that slowly, as we've seen. You know things like Ukraine, they'll do things slowly and so on. But they'll get there, whereas we can do things fairly fast. So, you know, there's give and take there. But ultimately it's about information, how much information we share. And because a lot of these aren't going to, these decisions aren't going to be determined by the military, they're going to be determined by, you know, civilian politicians being elected by a civilian, you know, sort of electorates, 
you know, the idea that we might be hooked up, to, frankly, to a, uh, a, a, you know, a Trump presidency does not <laughs> sort of uh, give uh, a great deal of safety and security to many people's hearts. So we need to broaden that, but we need to build that <coughs> trust up as well. And that means we've got to you know, do that, that, um, that work with our civilian, you know, again, get out there and talk a lot more about these things to the civilian electorate. Uh, and do so too. By the way, you know, people like yourself going and talking to people in the US and say this is a good thing because we've got to kind of overcome their local pork barrelling politics as well. I think in the case of um, you know, how we work with other nations, well, there's so much we can learn from our regional neighbours. I mean, well, we should be talking to the South Koreans about shipbuilding. They've got the best shipyards in the world. Uh, not to mention they're doing a lot more in their, you know, defence industries, et cetera, than we are. You know, we can learn so much from them as well. Um, uh, you know, there's other countries, and again, I know there was a talk today about Apple moving some of its manufacturing to Thailand, et cetera. So, you know, there's, there's things we should be talking to these countries about just, you know, beyond that to help broaden that base. Uh, the last thing I will say too is I, do, I worry about, going back to the point about you know, authoritarian envy, about, oh, we need to get more civilian military fusion. Uh, I, again, I, I, I worry about that. We don't want to have a securitised university sec sector or economy, etc. We need that because we need to, to keep going and generating those good economic outcomes which will sustain the rest. Having said that, things like moonshots do matter. And that's the sort of stuff we need to inspire again. You know, that will have spill over or spill in effects into defence outcomes. And that's the sort of thing we should be looking at. Great, Leslie. There's a, a lot there that we could um, continue to talk about, and maybe we will, because I'd like to turn over to uh, the audience now for, for questions. So I'm just going to hand Andy uh, my microphone. Thank you so much for your discussion today. Um, I actually want to go back to a question that I asked earlier today and I think is really relevant to something that you just said. And I was talking about deterrence by resilience. Um, and if we think about internal resilience within Australia at the moment to um, Chinese influence, and I'm particularly looking at the human cognitive realm, particularly in our civilian sector. If we think about our youth, they're currently, um, if they haven't heard of the word TikTok, then they're, they're not youth. Um, so how do we build resilience within um, the civilian sector to be even be able to talk openly and not shut down the conversation that that China is, that there's a threat coming that there is a threat that exists um, from China so how do we have those conversations how do we build that resilience uh, you're looking at me so I'll, I'll go go first um, uh, it's a, a terrific point you make, and I think you know we're slowly seeing an emerging uh, awakening of the um, out of our slumber from the the end of the Cold War uh, that people are going. Oh well, why are we talking about submarines? Why are we talking about you know spending three hundred and sixty eight billion dollars? Um, so I think people are waking up to the fact that there is a real threat out there, and that it it wasn't just our government, you know, trying to be uh, make trouble for political purposes, which I promise you it, it wasn't. And I think, you know, most, if not everyone in this room, will appreciate you know what that threat is, and and <coughs> pardon me, and how real and and present and near it, it actually is. So, uh, you know, I think it, it, it's one of those things that we just have to keep on having these genuine conversations with the people. Um, you know, the government now has to justify in their budget, and as we were talking about before, you know, about ratcheting up that spending. And what does that mean for people? You know, does it mean cuts to NDIS or, you know, higher taxes or, or whatever it is it's, it's going to come in next month's budget? Um, but, you know, those conversations are going to have to be had. Um, I know we have them a lot. We get a lot of phone calls in my office from from constituents because they know I'm interested in the, the defence space, um, you know, just testing uh, ideas about, you know, do we actually need this? Um, and I can pretty quickly paint them a picture, um, you know, of what's going on. I'm, I'm on the Joint Standing Committee for Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade. We don't get very many, um, uh, you know, uh, classified briefings, but uh, 
and very, very little. Um, I am hoping we get one on the on the DSR, but I'm also not holding my breath. Uh, but you know, the you know, just you know, there's so much out there that you know, can show people you know, where to go looking for the facts for themselves. There's so many great commentators and analysts and, uh, analysts and, and academics that are that are doing such wonderful work. You know, it's very easy to show people well, this is not just a political thing. You know, this is something that people think about and write about. Uh, uh, quite deeply. Uh, yes, good question and good points. Um, I think part of the problem is that there's two things. Firstly, the that you know the community is much more fragmented, and it's now you know by even by platform as well as by age group and so on as well. So it makes it very hard for particularly people in here to Canberra to really understand what it's like out there for people you know they'll talk to their kids they sort of have a sense but it's not not unlike I often say that government has a real you know it finds it really hard to talk to small business they've you know they're great at talking to other bureaucracies so the telstras and the bhps and so on because they look like them but when you come down to small business it's very difficult similarly with you know people who you know reside online on tiktok in those environments very hard for them to get their heads around and part of the problem too is that over the last 30, 40 years, we've also done away with, and part of it's because the change in the media, social environment, but we've also done away with one voice that could be trusted. You know, the ABC was, I mean, I grew up with, you know, listening to the country ABC when I, you know, growing up in central Queensland. It was the one point you'd go to. You'd listen to the other ones for music or something like that, but that was where you went to for news. My kids grew up with that in the house. Now I go to see, you know, when I go and visit them in Brisbane and Melbourne, none of them have they don't do that anymore. It's just not the thing. So there's no one, one, you know, there's no, you know, 730 news. There's there's very little of that anymore. So how, part of it is how the government now <laughs> starts messaging on the diversity of platforms. Uh, secondly is that, yes, this is going to be a work in progress. If it's not TikTok, it'll be something else. And I agree that, you know, the TikTok's, you know, God knows why I have it on their phone anyway. But anyway, um, particularly for government phone, seriously. Um, the point here again is that this is not going to stop. It's going to be a constant evolution, etc. And so, too often, you know, you'll find a government program that says we're going to do X. That's a, you know, that's the uh, KPI. That's a metric. We've achieved that. Tick. Move on. The next thing, etc. Uh, and then, or, you know, it might just, you know, or also have a life of its own and doesn't actually sort of say, is it, have we got the outcome? Because often the goalposts move in this, this space as well. So we have to have a. a it's, you know, somewhere we've got to build a far more savvy, I think it's a sort of, you know, that broader statecraft capability, uh, you know, that we just don't really have at the moment. At the moment we do have a much more of a heavy-handed, uh, you know, uh, regulatory, you know, legislatively driven approach rather than a sort of, you know, a far more nuanced approach. The other thing I would say too is that sometimes the PRC is great at undoing its own work. So that balloon was a big tipping point in people's perceptions, in the, particularly in the US. Probably not so much here, but over there it was, oh my God, you know, they're, you know, they're putting balloons up to spy on us. The, ignore the fact they've got satellites and so on. There's, you know, they have police stations in, you know, in New York, etc. But that balloon was a big, you know, a, you know, big awakening. And they can, so you're going, you know, they're very good at sort of, you know, I'm all in favour of someone's doing your work for you, don't get in the way. Um, you know, you'll, there is going to be that constant, you know, that shift because I'll get, you know, this is an authoritarian regime that's very entitled. Uh, and it's going to keep pushing. So we can rely on them to do some of that work for us, I think. I prefer not to have it that way, but, yeah. Um, I was struck yesterday by the Ukrainian ambassador, um, describing how he goes into universities to speak to undergraduates and asks some, um, you know, those who are prepared to fight for Australia, hands up and, you know, two out of ten. And then how many of you are prepared to not only fight but perhaps fall? Not many. And, and, and so, so it speaks to the need for a, um, a very sophisticated, nuanced conversation in Australia led by the, the political leadership. And Australia you know, in my view, has actually been pretty good over the last 10, 15 years in, in, in this dual-track conversation with China around economic prosperity and, and values and, and, and national security. And, and foreign ministers have been able to kind of 
uh, walk that fine line, whereas other nations have really struggled. Canada, for example, they, they just can't figure it out. It's just too hard. Um, so, but, but having said that, um, constantly repeating, uh, we, we will agree where we can and disagree where we must, and, and strategic equilibrium, I mean, the, 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 we kind of get that, but, but, but somehow the, you've, you've got to be able to connect with Australians and say, look, this is not, um, we're not in Kansas anymore. This is the, this is the 2020s. Uh, things are going pear-shaped uh, at a great rate. Uh, there's a huge threat uh, evolving. It's actually here among us. We're under attack every day. Um, we're, we're defending our values every day, and we need to prepare for... Um, not so much a worst case, but for, 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 for what could happen here. And, and so there has to be a conversation. That takes political courage, and that has to be balanced with, in my view, um, that uh, strategic calculus around, you know, if you go a little too far, then uh, the door slams shut in Beijing, no more ministers are going up, and I don't know why they're going on anyway, but that's another point. Um, but, but to go back to the senator's original uh, comment, um, you know, about iron ore and other commodities, you know, Western Australia stops, um, you know, once that door inevitably slams. So it's, it, it's a tough one. Okay, thank you um, so much for youth and technology, right? Um, so I'm from Montana. Thank you so much for your comments, by the way. Um, I'm from Montana originally, and just a little bit of an anecdote. One of the balloons flew over, and it was the first time a lot of my Montanan friends knew that we had nuclear sites in our state. <laughs> so just a little um, anecdotal, um, I think, addition to the conversation, right, about um, the kind of where does the public sit all of this? Where, in all of this, where does society sit? Where do we sit this conversation? And I was really intrigued by Senator Vance's um, comments, and I was just hoping you would be able to, um, I guess, give some indicators. You said Australian, Australians will demand budget uplift on defense. And I'm just curious what indicators you see that they will make that demand, because at least, you know, I have half my foot out of this world as well. And I think a lot of the times we assume that society is coming along with us when we're kind of ensconced. And I, I'm not sh so sure, um, but I feel like you would have your finger on that a lot better. So what, what are the indicators that you see um, would be great? I think um, indicators is a re really good way to put it. Um, I think, you know, the convers <coughs> pardon me, uh, the conversations we're having about TikTok at the moment, I think, is a great indicator. I think people are, are waking up to, oh, okay, something as innocent as TikTok is actually a danger to me. Um, you know, the the whole uh, misinformation, disinformation programs that are being run against Australia and and other countries. You know, r right now uh, are quite um, becoming far more apparent and being talked about. So I think that's a, another indicator. Um, you know, and I think b you're looking at some of the things that uh, are happening around the Ukraine war is, is probably, you know, again a, a, a real uh, indicator that, that people are becoming more and more aware of it. Uh, I work very closely with Vasil, the, the U Ukrainian ambassador, um, and, you know, he is doing a great job at edu educating Australians on, you know, how bad war can be. Um, and we are seeing it on our TV screens and, um, you know, I've seen it up, up close. It, you know, it truly is horrible uh, what is happening over there. So I think there's some of the indicators. Uh, I think also another lesson that, that the government um, should be taking out of Ukraine is... I don't know whether you remember in the early days where um, the US government was uh, quickly unclassifying intelligence they had on, on troop movements and the like and getting that out and letting people know and using that as a warning to, um, to Russia as part of their deterrence I think is another thing that we, uh, the government should be looking at, all governments should be looking at doing a lot more, especially around uh, what China's doing. Um, 
you know, whether it's you know, bribery in the in corruption in the Indo-Pacific, um, uh, particularly our, our Pacific neighbours, which is having a, a real eroding effect on on democracy over there. Uh, you know, being able to unclassify that or or in somehow reverse some of that damage and, and show people that this is actually happening. You know, it, it's not just a newspaper story. So I think you know, some reverse um, or some offensive misinformation, disinformation, cyber um, and, and other you know, hybrid techniques you know, have to be on the table. It's, it's just not about new capabilities, you know, new missiles or submarines. Yes, Thank you. Uh, I just add to that. Just going on, I think you mentioned you could see the budget going up, you know, potentially up to three percent. I think when we were th looking at hoping, yeah, I think our when I was doing this stuff with the, um, the SMH earlier, we worked out it was probably going to have to be around four. Uh, it will give us really, yeah. but again, all this has got lag effects, and I think part of the part of the problem we have in deal talking to the Australian public, you know, public is that by and large we, it's very Governments want to give a sense of, you know, a sh certainty and security. You know, yep, it's all it's all good. We've got to, we've got this. We can take care of it, etc. Rather than you know build a sense of panic, uh, or you know a sense of you know drive to to do things or do more. Uh, and then particularly too in the uh, in the defence sector, no, you know if we've got this, etc. So, you know, people will sort of say, okay, yep, we've got this. It's all under control. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that we also, we do tend to rely on our great and powerful friends, uh, and there is an expectation that they will come to us and you know help us out when we need to. But this increasingly is going to become as a quid pro quo. We're going to have to sit. You know, we're not sure they might be busy elsewhere. We might have to sort of take care of our own environment a lot more. We might need to contribute to that because that's also in our interest. I can't see any, for example, any situation in where a you know, Chinese invasion of Taiwan does not affect Australian interest. So, you know, getting the, across that line. And by the way, it's not as though, you know, it's um, that might be the, the trigger point for a conflagration. I mean, back in 20, you know, 1914, you know, Serbia was an annoying small territory of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. No one thought it would spark World War I. So these things can start elsewhere as well. Uh, and my concern is that level of latency, if you like, that level, you know, is you know uh, of potential of conflagration is just slowly rising in our region uh, and being pushed along, you know, by basically by China. But telling that story is quite hard because you know the grey zone tactics, the boiling frog problem, um, we get distracted by things like TikTok and that goes away, etc. Um, building that big, bigger narrative is going to be hard. Thanks, thanks for your comments. <clears throat> I'm sure you're familiar with the idea of the security dilemma. What that suggests is what, what one country does for its own deterrence can actually provoke another country. So, you know, we get these mes missiles so that, that we can reach Beijing and we think, well, this will deter them from trying anything, but then they look at the fact that we've acquired these missiles and think, well, what are they planning with the missiles? And so they strike first rather than waiting around for us to get in first. Um, so in that case, by acquiring all of these military capabilities, we provoke what we're trying to deter. We increase the likelihood rather than decreasing it of, of conflict. Uh, now, it, is that something that we should be worried about? The f and, and if it is something that we should be worried about, what are we doing to manage that risk of provoking instead of deterring? Uh, what what could we do? What should we do? What will we do? Yeah, I hear this argument a lot. My counter argument is that the best way of actually of of, you know, of uh, assessing the prospect of you know what we're already seeing is Chinese assertiveness, if not outright aggressiveness, is you know building up your capability for deterrence. Uh, the great at the mo at this point, you know, the great. Uh, balance of forces will say that even if we get those missiles, I'll just look and sort of shrug their shoulders. Yeah, so what? Because what can we affect at this point that would actually worry them? They've got other concerns. So, I mean, 
you know, I'm not particularly, you know, I don't particularly buy into that argument. The second thing is, uh, there's a lot of work to be done in, you know, open information. Uh, you know, we can be, we're, democracies are generally, generally much more open about what they're trying to do because they have to be, they have to persuade their own citizenry. Authoritarian nations are not. Uh, that said, I mean, you can go back and look at Xi Jinping's, you know, speeches, you know, the Ring of Steel, for example, telling his soldiers to sort of be brave and, you know, be bold, uh, etc. So you're getting a lot of signalling from one side which sort of suggests that they're getting more and more aggressive. And we're not saying the same for our side. So you sort of say, okay, there's a, there's a you know, lack of balance here in, in rhetoric. How can we overcome that will? We go in, we sort of point this out, we start opening up those channels, we try and find ways to have talks, etc. The two probably aren't irre irreconcilable. But frankly, you know, again, it's, you know, you're building up your capability to deter. To deter. Thanks. I'll just add, uh, we didn't start this um, arms race. You know, China has... Uh, you know, grown their military capability at a rate that's never been seen before. So I think the reverse of your argument is is actually what's happening, that, you know, we are now arming ourselves with, you know, nuclear submarines and missiles and, you know, long-range strike or uh, whatever it happens to be because of what China um, has been doing, is doing. Um, you know, it's... a uh, for, for the unit I studied under David, you know, last semester, you know, I wrote a, a piece that is arguing that you know, China is already at war with Taiwan and has been, you know, ever since the the uh, Revolutionary War, um, and uh, you know, and there's plenty of evidence for that. Certainly, in the irregular warfare fair space, you know, around whether it's you know their their cyber militia, um, their maritime militia, you know, these are th you know signs that you know really show that, you know, China is willing and able and is being an aggressor. So I think the, the reverse of your argument actually holds true. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, I'm going to wrap it up now. Uh, we're, we're at time, so um, I'm always amazed when I sit... Uh, hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll oh, get it. Uh, giddy up, Marcus. I'll, I'll keep it quick, and that is, um, is AUKUS just a huge mistake and a huge opportunity cost and a massive distraction from the task at hand? So, you know, it has all the hallmarks of a mega project, sucks huge amounts of money out of the investment plan, takes years to de deliver, and by the time it comes, the world has moved on and our requirements have moved on. So, you know, to be honest, I'm finding it really hard to convince myself that the submarine pillar of AUKUS is worth it. And and when I talk to normal people, I not the kind of people who sit in this room and get excited about this kind of stuff, I have not yet met a single Australian who wholeheartedly thinks spending $368 billion on submarines is a good idea. And so I'm already getting echoes of the fate of the attack class submarine, which died alone and friendless until it's corpse swinging in the wind was cut down and but has now been replaced by an even bigger <laughs> thing so, so what do i tell people like that because i'm i can't convince myself so um yeah what are we doing i'll let the first go yeah, uh, i have to admit i partly agree with you so <laughs> probably not the right person to ask either um, my preference would be to buy it just by virginia's Give more money to the Americans to build more, you know, up their rates of, pr you know, production. Virginia's we buy Virginia's. That's my personal preference. Yeah, I know, but get them now and sort of start building, you know, put more money into, the, into that sort of thing. Um, that would be my personal preference. Um, AUKUS uh, Pillar Two, I think, done well, or done, which means rather differently, offers opportunities, but not the way it's been handled at the moment. Um, I'd much rather see it. Um, there's two parts to AUKUS Part 2. One is the exploration generation. The other is translation and military capability. That's where the doctrine comes in. That's where the training comes in. That's where facilities, all that stuff comes in. This part, 
has to be in civilian sector. And that's just not happening. It's all kept there, and so, you know, it's very narrow, and so we won't get these spillover effects that Arthur Sinodinus thinks we're going to get. We know that from other defence projects as well. And as I said, I would like to see that third part, which is find out what we can do with what we've got now, urgently, um, and see if we, we can, you know, get it there, break it, break up, break things, break doctrine, break, you know, whatever works. This exactly what we're seeing happening in Ukraine at the moment. Um, and just, you know, slam it and see if we th what we can do with what we've got. But yes, I, I have to admit I'm certainly partly with you, Marcus. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be very quick. Uh, I, I can mount an argument for the SSNs um, all day, every day, but it's, uh, it's about the deterrence effect. Um, so I agree with you, as I said earlier, I just think they're too slow. Um, you know, we should have boats in the water, you know, right now. Uh, I've been running around to uh, putting my foreign affairs hat on, you know, having bilaterals with uh, all our friendly nations, uh, embassies around Canberra and saying, get some boats down here, it doesn't matter what they are. But if we're not showing uh, a capability to have, you know, whether it's uh, submarines or other battleships, you know, in the region, showing China that there is real international intent to uh, and willingness to deter, then it's not going to it's not going to deter them. So uh, I, I agree, we need them, but but the the, um, the fault is in the timing. So um, in, inviting allies and partners to, to to base or to operate out of Australia is one thing, which makes sense. Um, developing that, uh, yeah. De developing that uh, uh, um, indigenous Australian capability is, pr is pretty complicated. And uh, we're not ready to um, put Virginias to sea. I mean, y y there, there's, a, there's a critical path, and it's a fairly complex and, and long one to developing the technical authority capability in Australia. Um, and it's not just about a reactor in a submarine, as you know, Marcus. It's, it's about all of the other ancillary activities around, you know, uh, safety and stewardship and r regulatory frameworks and infrastructure and transport, rail, road, um, civil, state and commonwealth uh, emergency management and, 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 and leading the narrative w with Australians, all that kind of stuff. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's huge. T six years ago, Tony Abbott came up to me. Um, here's a little name drop for you. So Tony Abbott comes up and he says, uh, you're an admiral, um, so tell me, uh, SSNs for Australia, obviously that's the right thing to do. Right? And I said, um, no. Uh, and he really wasn't too pleased with that. But as a Canadian at the time, what I was trying, to, what I explained to him was the challenge around introducing a nuclear propelled submarine capability in a country that doesn't have yet have that in the order of battle is profound. It's, it is huge. And in, in Canada, there is a, um, a long, uh, you know, nuclear power generation industry history. Um, but what I've come to learn in my eight years here in Australia, and I'm, in Australia, and I'm now naturalized, is um, the appetite for ambition, uh, or, or sorry, the, the, the appetite for uh, strategic risk in Australia is very large. I mean, it's, it's impressive. So, you know, Australians kind of get down on themselves or ourselves, um, or you can call it foolish, but um, I, I still think that there's something very profound and impressive around that um, strategic risk uh, calculus. And at the end of the day, SSNs are absolutely the right capability for Australia. It's just that they're 15, 20 years too late. And so, but you've got two governments that have kind of gone for it. So, you know, I, I guess we should all lean in and, 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 and do what we can to enable the capability. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the Pillar 2 side, I'm a huge fan. and and. As the executive director of Security and Defense Plus, which is that alliance with the Arizona State University and King's College London, um, with UNSW, you know we are driving on that pillar too, uh, lo looking for ways to be en enable um, more seamless, integrated, trust-based, real collaboration. So guys like Andrew Neely get in the room um, at the classified level with his UK and American counterparts to 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 bring Australian innovation and expertise to bear on, on accelerating disruptive hypersonic capability and, and counter hypersonic capability. And, and 
and so we see ourselves in that alliance as, as that education and research exemplar in the tertiary sector. That's the way we're pitching it in London, Washington, and Canberra. Um, aspirational, perhaps, but the three university presidents are pretty keen uh, to see it happen. So I, I see real opportunity in Pillar 2, but as Leslie said, um, we, we could falter um, if we don't actually step out and, and, and lead the cultural change that's required to, to identify systemic, cultural, and regulatory impediments to, to truly collaborating as, as three trusting uh, partners. Um, so that's, that's my particular view as the moderator of the panel. And, and, and having said that, um, look, um, tremendous conversation, Senator and, and Leslie, thank you uh, for your time and, and for um, very thoughtful um, uh, assessments. Um, at strategic level, we were back and forth around a, a number of issues. It's been a pleasure to be here with you and I just ask uh, the, the crowd to join me in, in thanking you. All right, well, thank you very much. And um, I only have about 25 pages of wrap-up points. Should only take about an hour. No, seriously. Um, thank you for a really great 